All right, everybody, welcome back. This is the end of the world. Michael and Stu. I'm Michael. I'm Stu. Did you forget who you were for a second there? That was. Uh... Yeah, I did. Sorry. <laughs> Today, we are talking about the concluded just uh, last Thursday Democratic National Convention and mm -hmm. what it bodes in terms of uh, the potential end of the world. Uh, and also just how it was, <laughs> how it was in general, um, as, as you'll see, as you'll see in the coming weeks, we're going to have to start stretching the idea of the end of the world a little bit in order to kind of like diversify the kind of content that we cover. We don't um, just want to do every disaster movie ever made. We also want to think about the end yeah. of the world in terms of uh, media, the idea of a disaster, the idea of catastrophism this sort of thing and uh by the end, of the, right. the end of the episode we'll announce our next topic which will uh, <laughs> make apparent which will give you an idea yeah <laughs> which will make it apparent there's the shift that... and again i think that we'll we'll still we'll stay in our lane mostly but i do think that some of the political stuff applies pretty directly to the looming apocalypse as it were absolutely and uh before we get into the dnc however we have some opposite of end of the world news beginning of yeah. a brave new world uh michael what, that's right what is this this news we're well hearing? we're recording we were, we're recording on monday night for posterity august 26 2024 and we might want to say that because who knows what is going to happen tomorrow <laughs> because currently because currently on oasis's band website there is in the famous oasis font simply the date of tomorrow on their website and rumors have come out that of course an announcement is coming of what doesn't seem to be a tour but rather two shows or two sets of shows in manchester and london and at uh, wembley stadium is where they'll be playing in london apparently um and so this is yes this is kind of a segment but a brave new world in which uh <laughs> oasis joins the parade of vintage acts and um uh, updates our feeling of 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 feeling rather old right that's right and uh i'm very excited about this we're both big fans of oasis uh michael you actually <laughs> lived you actually lived yeah. in the uk during the 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 crisis the whole, well not the whole thing the crisis so, of brit pop <laughs> yeah so i did i did go there kind of in a pretty substantial two years right i mean definitely maybe had already come out but i the beginning of my stay in england was months in just months into it what's the story morning glory was released and i sort of had no idea what was going on i mean it was i was also 12. Right? Sure, sure um so loved it because that's kind of the vibe right uh it kind of fits perfectly for the fake angst of a fake angsty 12 year old to like get down with the oasis vibes and then I actually, the second album, the third album, it'll Be Here Now, came out in 1997, uh, a couple months, a couple, actually, a couple days before I left and a couple months before the rest of the family came back. Um, and um, the, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that um, in terms of the mania surrounding a band. Of course, it was obviously a different time and people would line up outside right. the HMV to get their copy but people were staying outside record stores for days to get what was let's say a disappointing effort be here now where do you come out on the uh, be here now wall? <laughs> interesting like i remember like you when what's the story morning glory hit i was living in connecticut we were actually staying at my grandmother's house uh because mm -hmm. we had moved and our new house was getting fixed up before we could move in and so we stayed for but the summer and part of the fall. And I believe this would have been when I was in eighth grade or something like that. And I just, I, it's one of those albums where I have such a specific visual memory of like the space, which was like my aunt's old bedroom. Like this, like yeah, yeah. still decorated like it was the sixties. And <laughs> uh, just listening to that record, a uh, couple other records came out. I remember I think Fish, Billy Breathes came out uh, not long after well, that. Well, Blur. 
as well, right? Well, Blur was not on my radar, though. I was living in the United oh, States. Oh, sure. Right? Well, over, over there, that yeah. was the big battle for the heart and soul of the British nation was between Blur and Oasis. And the I think the singles were Roll With It and Country House, I right. believe. And, were and, the, yeah. And, and so just, what happened was, they, you know, the battle for who was going to be number one and Blur took it. And then whether it's true or not, some people think it was like Oasis PR people put out this idea that like a bunch of the rec CDs at HMV wouldn't scan for Oasis. So actually they probably should have been number one. But um, it's funny because you get to that, you know, you get, I, generally nostalgia is um can create a lot of problems for a culture i think um, um yes and, <laughs> you know and i'm sure we'll, we'll delve into that as we stretch our legs in the podcast a bit more but it's funny that i you know growing up you see these vintage acts let's call them you know they're trotting out the rolling stones at sars fest sure and stuff i mean like i that. saw and, the the who in 1997 sure right and you, you know? and there's an you, you sense in your youth this air of desperation and then some bands start doing it and you don't think they're great bands and you're like, oh, this is so gross. And then a band that you actually really liked as a kid yeah, decides they're yeah. getting back together for a few shows. And I am like, fly me to Manchester in earnest. I will fucking cry at this concert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went, uh, I, I, I listened to a bunch of Liam's solo shows uh, and he still has all the attitude. Voice, maybe not quite quite as a uh, soaring as it once was, but you know, yeah. his, his vibe bonehead is still there. Some of the other original Oasis oh, side men are in Liam's band. Uh, but as far as be here now goes, I was at boarding school. So I went away to boarding school in 97 and that was one of the records that I like sent away for, or like had my parents buy and send me. Cause I was so excited mm-hmm. about uh, listening to it. Yeah. And I remember being like, this is a bit grand, right? That was yeah. my big takeaway. Like, there was a lot of strings. The so- there was a bunch of songs that were, like, eight minutes long. And well, there was a- All Around the World. Oh, that's the one I'm thinking of, Which right? is so long, so pointless. It's so self and it felt key-, like- key changes. Yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I think there was. I, be- I believe there was an interview a couple years later where Liam... Probably Liam. He seems to have a little bit more self-awareness than Noel. I don't know where you stand on that, but... I agree. Um, where Liam was like, yeah, we just did a way too much coke and thought we were the greatest thing ever and the, the album sucked. Uh, I think some of the songs on it are okay. I think it sounds sure. good. I listened to sure. it not that long ago just to There's like There's some Oasis songs on there. I'll, yeah, I'll say yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not as good but as... But I think it. people were people were also a little taken uh, aback by the, the choice that... Was it... Uh, what was the song called? Do You Know What I Mean? Yeah, yeah. It was the, the lead single... It's like a little bit not what people wanted, I felt, feel when it well, came out. Well, I think out. the Britpop pop um, thing was also just kind of running out of gas, right? I mean, yeah, sure, like OK sure. Computer But it's still only two years after. Right, but I mean... Right, so, so OK Computer happens and then you go in with like, don't go away. And it's like, OK, man, you're, this well, is cause not like, hit. I mean, not to go too deep on this, but like the Britpop thing was sort of, from their perspective, a kind of an- antidote to the like, despair and gloom of grunge right yeah, like live yeah, forever yeah. was like his yeah like, there's an optimistic response to, to Oasis, i sure. hate myself yes. and i want to die the nirvana song that was the b-side yeah. to their final single um and i think that was good but then uh, you know these things go in pretty quick cycles much quicker now mm. than even then so by 97 it's like you've got radiohead who were kind of in the Britpop mix a little yeah. bit with uh, the Benz and certainly Pablo sure. Honey, the, that grunge yeah. Britpop. Uh, and then they released this album, OK Computer, that's just much more sophisticated, right? And right. it's it's like, oh. And Oasis it's like, added oh. strings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh. And then, you know, Radiohead would continue to develop in these weird yeah. ways with Kid A and whatnot. <laughs> and Oasis can kind of continue chugging along, did a few more decent albums, did some more good songs for sure. but. Yeah, so it is, but you, but to back to the main topic, like, it is very funny to be of an age where the your childhood heroes are are now the rolling yeah. what the Rolling Stones were when we were kids. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Rolling Stones never broke up, but you know, they just kind of like trot themselves out, and you're like, oh, there's Mick Jagger, right. oh, they're playing Star, right. they're and playing like, Start Me see... Up, a song they recorded in like... 1976. You know, like... now you can just clearly see the like the sort of desperate financial cash grab of it all that they're going to create this 
whole probably this whole story i'm guessing i'm just guessing this whole story of coming back together you know i'm seeing a documentary probably being yeah filmed yeah, yeah. This thing. whereas like the real story is like noel owes like eight million pounds in taxes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like... and and so you know we're people are gonna pay so they make 50 million dollars or pounds or whatever yeah playing a handful of shows and people will be genuinely moved by it and i don't think we have time to talk right now about what that means for us as a society but there's something there i think to yeah explore there's there's the something future that, apocalypse based yeah episode. and also just it fits into the general like mood of decline you know mm -hmm. now like but That's i mean right. we've been in this decline for a while but this is just the latest kind of right. iteration but by, by the same token it's also nice that oasis will the brothers will play concerts again god bless them oh i i, I can't i cannot wait um Speaking of uh, things we cannot wait for, the election is fast in coming. I feel like every day I see a, <laughs> it's only 72 days until, you know, I'm just, but then the dates kind of shift a little bit. One person says 75, one person says, I'm like, yeah. like uh, uh, the election soon. We had the DNC, um, cor the coronation of uh, Kamala as the Dems nominee after the whole Michigas with I, I just want to ask I, I just want to ask was was there was there more time between conventions than typical I couldn't I haven't looked at the dates but it, it felt, it felt like, like the it. RNC was a little earlier than conventions usually are yeah like I usually feel like there's a week or two between this one felt like I, th I usually think there was weeks, a week maybe. between, and we could have we could have easily looked this up. I before. think convention. <laughs> I think the convention for conventions is that the incumbent party's convention is the second one. I, I yes. don't. I, I don't think that's a law, but I think it's just tradition. Um, so. But they didn't push their convention back or anything as a result of no, Biden. These, these this were, was the schedule. These were the dates. Yeah. Um, and this, I mean, again, like I don't know what the Republicans grander strategy was in this election and I, I don't know what it is right now for sure but it just seems like a bad idea to be so early i mean it just seems like you've lost your momentum there's still like you said it is close to the election it's not that close i mean you're still no. talking about two more than two full months yeah i mean it was basically and, three months before the and in a, in a in a situation where you don't do debates you maybe do one more well you there's maybe going to be anymore. one that's up in the air already i don't know trump that's so, right and the, and the debate is, is going to be in like 10 days or you know, right September whereas 10th you know you go back to 2012 and i think 2016 as well but definitely in 12 all debates happened after the conventions so and there were three yeah. So there were multiple chances for a, for a candidate to say something to millions of Americans, and there really isn't now, from here until November. Now right? I remember, I, I remember Michael, you attended uh, the RNC in the past. Did you ever attend yeah. the, the DNC? No. Um, and then I also I did. You went to CPAC, stuff, right, or something? I, like I that. went to CPAC a, a a bunch. I went to CPAC <laughs> way before it was cool. Yeah. You know, Back before, I, like I, the, the leftists were like infiltrating CPAC and. Well, it was it was actually so like I I moved down to New York in '09 and I was writing a a column for um, a Canadian magazine, and I ended up just covering essentially. The, you know, an editor there, they just want stories about crazy Americans, right? That's no, like, in Canada, right. that's yeah, also yeah. in Canada, no way. And at the time, the crazy Americans were the Tea Party, right? Um, so much has changed. Uh, it seems so quaint. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, would go to some Ron Paul stuff, and then I ended up going to CPAC. And this is for, I think, we'll save this stuff for when we talk about the Republicans in more detail. Sure. But I, it is, it is pretty fascinating. Just today, I was actually talking to Maggie, my, my girlfriend, about the, the, the CPAC that I went to uh -huh. and how different it was, even though it was also totally nuts at the time, obviously, you know, still crazy. And this was just but how 14 years ago uh, or whatever. Just, just like, not only was it last, the only thing I'll say now is that only, not only was it so much softer, mm. it, 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 the people who were doing the like tread on me, people were like dressed up like, Paul Revere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it felt more like cosplay, whereas mm -hmm. this feels like we are on the precipice of a potential civil war. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's not good. I think a lot of 
there's still a cosplay element to a lot of what happens. At yeah, the but I was, I'm saying they're actually dressed up like. <laughs> no, I, I they have the in, wig on the, and the tricorn. Yeah, hat yeah, and, that's yeah, right. Yeah, the stockings. But anyway, so go back to the, the convention. It's like it felt like my takeaway, first takeaway, is that it just felt really hard for the Democrats to fuck this up. The momentum, I don't really think I've ever felt such a clear momentum for one party heading into a convention like yeah, this. Yeah, I agree. And it felt like they could basically do whatever they wanted, and people would say that it was incredible and showed that she, Harris, had it together. I, I, that is what happened for mainstream pundits. A hundred percent. Because they, they put on a performance that was largely pathetic and truly awful politically yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean maybe act electorally it's smart i don't care it's so disgusting well it's morally uh, reprehensible um but before let's build up to that i mean that's <laughs> yeah okay. let's talk about some of the undercards before we got to the big the final um, yeah grueling disappointment that was uh harris's le lethal mm -hmm. lethality speech um so i watched every single minute of the DNC. Uh, I'm not usually the kind of person that does that, but yeah. Uh, now that I'm a member of the media, thanks to this this wonderful show that we do. I know. And sorry to our listeners that we weren't actually on the ground. Now you know oh, we, we probably wouldn't have been let in. I mean, the the guys from True no. and True and and Chapo. I don't think they were able to get into the. Yeah, convention. I bet we'd be more likely because they were like they're like they're you like, have you're, how you're, many followers? You guys are nobody. Sure. Oh sure, come, come on, on in. <laughs> Here's a VIP pass. <laughs> well, there was an influencer stage. I don't know if you right like where right. like uh, presumably Brooklyn. Yeah, they let us. They let us like they let us like watch the influencers <laughs> yeah well like brooklyn dad defiant and people like that oh, he was there. well i don't know if he yeah. was but someone like that you know just like completely yeah. blue pill um you know probably Aaron. Well, should we let's i mean i don't know let's start with a guy that we like sean fain yeah right? like uh, the first night uh i've got notes for all the nights like i thought sean fain while he's not the most dynamic speaker perhaps uh was one of the few people who was just kind of like spitting fire as the young people say or did say five mm -hmm. years ago a I real know. fire brand right? yeah yeah i mean he had he had a couple lines he says uh you know donald trump is all talk kamala harris walks the walk okay but he called trump a scab <laughs> which i liked and he, <laughs> and he slammed him he slammed him for for his interview with elon where he was like oh elon you're so good at firing striking workers and stuff and i think like because right. you know the the republicans for the last uh dec since the tea party have tried have been trying to like position themselves as though they are the real party of working, yes. working people right yeah and you know so rhetorically at least but in terms of actual policy that is absurd obviously and it's mm -hmm. nice to just have... They, but they both do a good job of not being that. Right. But I mean, yeah. the Democrats at least do a little bit... You know, Biden, for all his flaws, did appear at a picket line. He was the first president to ever do that, right? I mean... Yeah. You know... He but there's the minimum wage, but well, yeah. Well, that's not entirely... He walked on a line. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's not entirely his But in fairness, fault. there are a lot of union... There are a lot of union people who are very happy with Joe Biden's performance as president. That that's is right. True. That's right. I think that, like... You know, comparing two bad apples, so to speak, the the Republican apple has significantly more worm uh, damage there. Right. Right. I mean, right. and um, so I liked him. Uh, he actually kept hitting on the. Do you think he thinks that about Kamala Harris? No. The quote I, is Donald Trump is all talk and Kamala Harris walks the walk. I mean, in a limited way, I'm sure he does. Like, yeah, but. You know, it felt just politically calculated. It's a, it's a performance, right? Yeah, and I think, that's right. You know, the other um, major union leader appeared at the RNC, right? Uh, and then was <laughs> yeah. and then was not uh, invited. Like very yeah. no, like other members of his union were invited and, and spoke, but sure. Uh, so I think, you know, this was like a repudiation of that. At least. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would, I would, I would love, I would take Fain as president. I think of the people who were on the stage over the four days, I think he would probably get my vote as president. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, him or Bernie. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, <but> we <laughs> already tried that. That ship has sailed. Um, <laughs> then AOC came, and this has been a uh, scene dividing appearance by AOC. Right, a lot of left lefty people that we probably follow are very angry at her for kind of pivoting more to the center um mm -hmm. but then other uh lefty people 
are who are slightly more pragmatically oriented were like, no, you don't understand. Like, she's got to get into like power to then like you know it's the same thing that we always hear, right? Yeah. Like, like now that she's in power, she can really enact change, and it's like yeah. Okay. That's that, happened so often. Yeah, that we're, when, was, when was the last time? That you, I, do you know how that, often that's happened? <laughs> that's so, happened so often that we're still saying they've got to do this to be able to get into power. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, guys. Do you like hear yourselves? Like, like... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty grim. Uh, that said, I, I think she's a good speaker. And she did speak about herself as, uh, again, as a working person, which I thought was good. And... She kind of uh, pivoted away from some of her more divisive. Uh, uh, Medi- she didn't talk about Medicare for all. She didn't talk about some of the policy points, the Green New Deal, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's a little bit more divisive, despite you know being just like utterly reasonable and not crazy at all. Sure. But it's treated as though she makes so her it has seem no place in a convention, right? I mean, Jen, who, who, who do you think you are, Mao Zedong? You know that, that like <laughs> that's the <laughs> attitude of someone. Yeah, says, like didn't they say that Harris was a communist because she wanted to give people money for a down payment to keep the housing market afloat? Is yeah, that... I mean, it's it's pretty silly. Um, Classic commie maneuver. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, the other big highlight, uh, well, Jim Clyburn, who's just a mummy, whom I still despise for what he did to, <laughs> to Bernie in 2020, uh, mm. was there. A- Andy Bashir spoke. He's a good speaker, but he's dull as heck, so I was kind of like, all right, I get why they passed on him. He was one of my early... Yeah, because he was, an, he was one of the candidates That's to be right. vice president. Right. Yeah. And then uh, Hillary appeared and is still somewhat of a Man. bad robotic speaker it was my main takeaway. Yeah, I just don't see what she's getting out of this at this point. Well, I think a part of it was... It, it, it was the extent to which her speech was about her and like 2016 was kind of shocking to me. I was kind of like, but, yeah, I mean, again, you just go through it, right? It's like so indicative. You know, you go through these processes for a long time now we've been doing, we've been watching these, right? And it's yeah. like, all right, so it's Hillary, Bill, Obama, they're going to have primetime slots at the DNC until we're dead or until they're dead. Like when... You know, it's yeah, like, uh, yeah, basically, you know, this is this has been the same thing. I mean, and, and, you know, generally speaking, I think it's what's interesting about this race and this convention. And it's sort of shown by the the relative smoothness. I mean, I didn't like the content, but no, was it they kind of have their uh, their groove back a little bit. Right. I sort of think like the presentation of democratic politics was ascendant under Obama. Right. Sort of starting with 04 with his keynote address. But then in 08 and 12, there was a real shift where Bush, Bush's comms, Bush's PR, Bush's presentation was so much better than Gore and Kerry. The Dems were kind of just like couldn't put it together. And it flipped in the course of the Obama age where the Republicans were defined by people like Marsha Blackburn, you know, yeah. and <laughs> this this smooth guy is great speaker. This really impressive, good-looking guy, but the rest of the team could kind of play, and so Bill Clinton could come on and and zing, a, issue yeah. singers. What was he? He was the explainer in chief. Right, Remember right, this? Right, right, of course. And and we've kind of gotten back to it. It it, it, it the irony to me is that this whole slogan of like is that we won't go back. We're, We're not, not going, going back. back. Yeah. And we we have gone back. We have gone we have basically, back. Yeah, that, that's that's sixteen I, was this weird situation that they don't want to admit what happened or what it meant. I think politically. Well, that's the, yeah, right. And then twenty twenty wasn't an election because of the well the, the various. Yeah. I mean, it was it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, a, conven- it wasn't was a conventional media environment slash especially after COVID and, and didn't this, have a this, presentation. This, like the this. spectacle wasn't there. There was no big right. A party right. there were no right and so you see a lot of it starting with hillary for me was really the first one but aoc too to a lesser extent where you just see this recapturing of the sort of obama like the premise of obama's politics which we thought had been so disproven i think in trump years and biden years and the Clintons as the sort of elder statesmen of right. the party. And we're right back there. You know, we're right back to the origin stories of everybody in their campaign speech. My my granddaddy was a barkeep in Yeah, Topeka. my my mother was born <laughs> before women could vote and she raised yes. me to this and that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um so the highlight or low light 
or whatever light of night one was Biden himself coming and sort of. Who they us. made start speaking at eleven thirty p.m. I know. I was uh, waiting on. Felt purposeful. Waiting with bated breath for Biden to emerge. <laughs> And uh, he was better than at the debate. He kept saying, that's not that's not a hyperbole. That's not a hyperbole. That was like his, uh, <laughs> that was his look, you know. Yeah. His, 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 hand, his handlers are like, okay, if you get lost in a train of thought, just say that's not hyperbole. Yeah. It'll cover yeah. basically everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, my basic takeaway was just that, like, you know, even when he's a little more can- coherent, and I found myself oddly agreeing with uh, David Brooks. I was watching the PBS uh, feed, and they would occasionally cut away to their famed commentariat. And mm-hmm. David Brooks, who I you know normally loathe, I saw once uh, in a train station. I saw David Brooks, and he saw me knowing, noticing who he was and looked very worried. Not unlike Joe Lieberman, actually. I think Brooks mm-hmm. a very a much smaller man than I, than I would have assumed. But um, Brooks's take was like, you know, it was a fine speech, but basically, like, it was a good illustration of why Biden had to go. Because his point was yeah, just that, yeah, yeah. that Biden is just so angry now. Like, there was mm-hmm. so much rage and, like, yelling. And he was like, look, this offers no contrast with Trump, who's just, like, the ultimate candidate. That's true. But I think vote. it's also, you know, um, it's also a physical, I think, or, um, like, intellectual limitation, like, cognitive. It feels to me like he can't slow down. He can't. Yeah. Because you can see when he's when he's talking in in a slower fashion, like they told I guess told him to do at the debate, and he has to start listing things. It it really starts to struggle. And in terms of being angry, like I mean, I've seen way less important people get bumped by the to the tune of an hour and a half and come out very upset. Liam Gallagher, you couldn't do that to Liam Gallagher. <laughs> And this guy's the president of the United States. I mean, I'm sorry. I thought it was that was like the one thing I really think was pretty shitty. It's like I don't know. You can't you can't cut Bashir like 11:30 for this guy. Well, they did cut they did cut James Taylor, much to my enormous anger. (laughs) I was was why I I was raging. But uh, you know, I I am not. uh, I'm obviously not a pro Biden guy. Sure, but um, I'm not so sure that his performance in these last four years will end up going down as worse than Kamala Harris's in the next four. I'll tell you that. I think that's fair. That's very fair. On top of that, whatever you want to say about Joe Biden and him getting out of the race and all of that, he got out of the race. He did. And it. it turned the race, frankly, in a way that if you put Harris or whoever else through the ringer of a two year primary system, I actually don't know if it goes this well. And so there's a bit of a debt of gratitude to Biden beyond the lip service of how he's a national hero for understanding <laughs> democracy is so important. I'm talking strictly from a cynical political perspective. This guy deserved more than to go out when he could barely like put a thought together. So all he could do was like yell. I yeah. mean, it just it it seemed a little bit offensive. I maybe not purposeful, but like they, they do Kamal Harris, or Kamala Harris of all these people owes something to joe biden i mean come on oh yeah like she was she was and also ran in the primaries still became vice president um showed no real electoral strengths wasn't particularly good as a vice president or pre- vice presidential candidate <laughs> wasn't impressive yeah and she got she got given the presidency well, not well, having to the, earn nom- the nomination let's not get well that. i mean i'm saying a, a chance at the presidency right yeah yeah. And and in a way that has clearly benefited her the most in terms of her chances to actually win this thing. Oh yeah, um, I agree. So I thought that was really weird that they couldn't trot him out by ten o'clock or you know. Whatever. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So night two, uh, there was the endless roll call, which I kind of tuned yeah. out from. I uh, played some video games on my phone. Maybe I did you ever <laughs> watch any. Did you ever watch any of those? The only one that I actually did was 08. Yeah, I watched. No, I it was on was cool. in the background. I was like dimly paying attention oh sure sure uh i thought the georgia one was good because they brought out uh little john Um, yes yeah other than that uh, pretty some states just don't have like a great musical artist that they could use as the the backbone of their Mm -hmm. uh, my home my uh, parents home state of maine (laughs) i was like oh yes maine (laughs) like (laughs) home of many famous rap star oh no Mm -hmm. anyway uh, Chuck Schumer spoke. What a joke. Charismaless scumbag. These are my notes written at the time. 
Uh, nails Trump for being an anti-Semite. Fair. But doesn't talk about the other thing. Which just doesn't mention the war in Gaza at all, which was a, a th- mm-hmm. one of the big omissions. Uh, no, almost no one, no one talked about Gaza until uh, the end in a very dispiriting and... Um, yeah, that, I mean, this is, this is classic democratic... Well, I think Politics, we'll, let's circle right? back. Let's circle back to that because I think that's where we're going to end on when we sum up mm-hmm. our feelings about all this. Uh, Doug Emhoff came, was extremely sappy, kind of told a meandering speech about his courtship. Yeah, with, who uh, cares? He Kamala. sucked. Michelle Obama came as a much better speaker than everyone else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, uh, it's <laughs> fascinating. The Ob- Michelle Obama thing is fascinating, right? Because I mean, obviously, she's made it clear that she doesn't want to be in politics. To be yeah. a oh, politician, to be a, can- a, can- president. a candidate, yeah. And and yet, it's not it's not part of the the PR machine. It's not strictly part of the Obama PR machine. Myth. Michelle Obama is an incredible public speaker. Yeah. Yeah. And like I think what's amazing, and granted, there's a lot of limitations in who gets into these nights and who rate who gets risen up to be able to do a primetime speech at a convention. Sure. Very small list. But it's so crazy that the two of them are the best are speakers. definitely yeah. the two best. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I mean, I think not... I think Bill Clinton is a really good speaker too, but very yeah. much yeah. diminished now, which we'll talk about in the well, next sure. night, but... at, at his peak, though, I think he was still one. Tick below. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, Definitely Barack. I mean, Barack's like, for for all the reasons we've come to dislike Obama. I mean, he's just so much better at it than these other people. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> and, and then and then Michelle gets up and is like, "Wait, you're the second best of all the people." Yeah. This <laughs> That's awesome. You know? It's like wow. It's not like she started <laughs> training really hard while she was the first lady. She didn't even really want to be. Yeah. Yeah. In it. And obviously, she had to. Well, she's an get att- she's an attorney. Addresses. She's a really good. You There's know, so many very attorneys smart on stage, person, man. Obviously, There's so many lawyers on stage. Yeah, she's so much but better. She's than much better than them. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just saying, like, trying to come up with some yeah, rational Obama, explanation. Obama's Obama's still doing his like Trump thing that he's kind of been stuck on. Yeah, he did a joke about dinner. the Trump's crowd size obsession is because of an ana- inadequacy in another area. Ooh, very Zing. good. Uh, very good. I Little s- Donald, got it. Uh, my notes for the Obama speech were uh, a lot of rehash stuff about Trump, dull, he thanks Biden, who cares? And then I just wrote, say something insane, please. You know, just really yeah, want, I mean, I want say to say something. I just I want mean, something unexpected, something that's really out of sure. left field and weird. But that, that of course, is not going to happen. Well, it's this, 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 this is part of the problem with Obama and it has been the whole time, which is that, you know, sure. he had the tone. He had the tone about Trump in the correspondence dinner. He had the tone about Trump when when Hillary was running. He used to be like. This guy's out here selling steaks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The entire political mainframe uh, is just erupts under under Trump, and eight years pass, and this guy gets on stage and does essentially the same thing, yeah. and does essentially the same thing, and, and this and this is just indicative of a guy who's so brilliant, who either cynically this is exactly the type of world that he wants to exist. He's now part of the venture capital Richard sure. Branson billionaire club, yep. or this is like he doesn't have it in his locker to this, do anything. This is a limitation that he has, maybe. This is yeah. a limitation, maybe. Yeah, it could be. Uh, he said, "We live in time of such rancor. We chase the approval of strangers on our phones." <sighs> oh, sorry. Dude, you release a playlist every year. <laughs> I mean, yeah. This guy's telling, still telling me to what book to read. Yeah. And what songs to listen to? We We're build, chasing the. We, we, we build the walls and fences and wonder why we feel so alone. Oh my God! Like, yes. Well, this is, and we'll see this, you know, when we get to Harris. But this is sort of what I mean by we're not going back. Well, we are back. And yeah. one of the things that we're back about is when the Democrats sense that they can win an election, they do the same thing as when they sense they can lose an election, which makes the Democrats so infuriating. 
they cite Ronald Reagan at their convention. Yep. yep. And they they invite Fitch. Rag. They they're so happy about the Republicans who don't like Trump, right? And all the fifteen like these, Republicans, right, who come on stage and are like, oh, I never thought tr- I never thought I'd be here, you know. So. Right, right. And they're so proud and they all clap, like, look what we did. And you know, if it dev- that doesn't happen on the other side. On the other side, they're like, You think you're coming over here? Get the fuck out of this place. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And just to see like whenever they think they win, here comes the patriotism, right? And one of the things that then they do is that actually we all have this common ground that still doesn't exist, despite the fact that they're polling better. Yeah. But we're gonna do this all fucking over again. So the third night was a lot of what we were just complaining about. A lot of January 6th talk. They brought in a cop from mm. the Capitol Police. Uh, mm-hmm. Stevie Wonder made an appearance. Still looks pretty good for someone his age. Still, uh, yeah, you know, man. Uh, he is. He's still got it. Yeah, he's still got it. He was good. Uh, then they brought out Keenan, who uh, Keenan Thompson, who <laughs> is older than I am, and yet looks like he is still twelve. Yeah, uh, it looks fantastic. Got a baby face look. One of my friends from high school was actually one of the uh, Sharia Smith, who's a public servant uh works in the government was one of the interlocutors i was very uh happy i was like wait a minute is that is that oh my god that's you know it was just like one of those weird moments when mm-hmm. someone from your like earlier part of your life appears on national television it doesn't happen very <laughs> often I think it's once or twice before for me right. um you know it was fine mindy kaling uh all the stars are, <laughs> all the stars are here uh hakeem jeffries appeared he said that trump is a bad ex-boyfriend yes what was this i don't i don't know i just it was just it was a bad it doesn't make any sense in any real in any way i guess is it because he was president he's a bad ex-boyfriend who won't leave you alone right he wants to get back into your life and we got to say no to him like you know crush crush and then the the highlight was uh, uh bill clinton Came out. He wasn't actually. Well, Pelosi I mean, was there too. Well, no, no, no. I, I have Bill Clinton was kind of for me the highlight. Uh, still, oh, sure. he's still smart. He seems diminished. I mean, he's lost a lot of weight. He's obviously had illness struggles with his heart. Mm-hmm. Um, he referred to Biden as though he were George Washington, Cincinnatus. <laughs> yeah. You know, boldly, <laughs> bravely laying down power. Uh, but he's yeah. still smart. I mean, you really when Clinton speaks. I know I saw Clinton speak once live, and it was a. Uh, Right after 9-11, maybe October, he came to Yale mm-hmm. to give a talk about um, the Yale Tercentennial, which was the most alluded with. We should do an episode on that. It's, it's just apocalyptically <laughs> self-indulgent event I've ever mm-hmm. attended. Also interrupted by 9-11. Yale's like, oh, we're celebrating our 300th anniversary. It's like, oh, Yeah. You are? <laughs> <laughs> and so then Clinton gave the speech, at, 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 and I was, you know, 100 yards, 200 yards away listening. And I was like, damn. You know, in that moment of uncertainty, Clinton was like, it's going to be okay, guys. We're going to, like, work together. <laughs> you know, and he had just been president. I, I, I don't know. I mean, he's obviously an extremely bad person and has mm-hmm. terrible, did terrible things politically. But I still have some weird effects. And personally. And Brad personally. I mean, that's I, I said he's a bad person, right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, he was fine. Uh, Pelosi didn't have much to say, but she seems more together than Biden or Shudder Feinstein at the end of her, yeah. her time. Oh, uh, jeez. And she's, so she's a bit older. Yeah, Pelosi's got four or five terms in her yet, right? Yeah, I mean, she's only 85, <laughs> right? I mean, she can serve until she's 100. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Josh Shapiro, uh, following Obama, fa- oh, fake Obama, boy, loads of did, did they dodge did a bullet? They make the right, yeah. Did they dodge a bullet or what, man? Yeah. That, if it was really that close, well, that's what I that, thought not, with all of the these other people. Don't decide elections, but man, yeah, with the way the momentum was going, it would have been with bad. the Harris thing, where it looked like everything they put online, all their comms were so strong. The Shapiro appointment for VP would have been hard to keep that feeling going that walls sort of captured her, instantly her, yeah i agree uh amanda gorman not my favorite writer uh recited uh some poems, yeah, yeah. A poem that was a great a great example of we're not going back but we're actually right back where we started well the thing about her um, is that like her writing is exactly the same as it was in the last time we heard from her you know it's like mm-hmm. there's no 
maturation. Yeah, she's, of, she's following the Obama playbook. Yeah, right? she's <laughs> just still as bad as she was four years ago. Uh, I'm sure yeah. she's a nice person, God bless, but uh, I, I was just like, what are we doing, people? Oprah came and killed, yeah. killed it. Good speaker. I mean... Home turf, right? Oh, yeah. That was probably mm -hmm. a big... But still, Oprah made sure to everyone to know that she's still an independent, you know. Um, she still wants <laughs> zero taxes on her billions. And Just to uh, be clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. Uh, Wes Moore spoke. I thought he was good as the governor of Maryland. Uh, God, there were so many speakers. This was such a slog, Michael. Uh, Mayor Pete. Yeah, we, I think we can just we go. We can skip to the to end. The... Waltz came. He did his whole thing that he's been doing. Mm -hmm. It was good. He's, there's some nuance added to his stump speech. Yeah. Uh, I've already well, heard Trump weighed Trump weighed in. Uh, I think while he was speaking, saying it, was this. Well, it was either when he was speaking or it was definitely during the convention. the The tweet was um or the truth. The truth is that what they call it? Yeah. The truth. Oh, of course. Um, the truth social that Walls is not a coach. He's an assistant he wasn't a coach. Football coach. He's an assistant coach. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Where Where do you stand on that? Well, I don't think that's like a meaningful distinction when you're a football player. Certainly, like. We had a head yeah, coach. Yeah, you, you played a bit. Yeah, I mean, I was recruited to play in college and wisely, for my mind's sake, but, decided not to. But the head coach was different than the assistant coach. Right? Yeah, in that he didn't do anything. Like, the assistant coaches were the ones who were actually with you doing drills and stuff, and the head coach right, was more of the, like, right. grand strategy guy, kind of yell at you in the locker room kind of guy. Sure, sure. So I, I, I thought it was a little, I mean... Well, and it's also weird because he's running for vice president. So he isn't. So it's not. It does, it's like what? It doesn't even seem like. Yeah. yeah he Trump, just, Trump's not bringing. Long, Trump's not bringing his A game anymore. He just doesn't have his fastball anymore. Yeah. You know, and once once the posts suffer, all is lost. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go to the final night. A um, mm. lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Warren. Mm -hmm. Steph. Mm -hmm. Steph Curry. Ugh. L. Yeah, M. Hoff. Oh L. M. Hoff appeared. Incredibly long, oh, yeah. incredibly long neck. All the, all the way from Bushwick. Yeah, yeah, long neck, longest, incredibly long neck, longest neck since Merton Hanks was my uh, yes. my initial read. That's right. It's a Number deep... thirty six for the San Francisco. Oh, uh, what a great player! Uh, I love Merton Hanks when he would run uh, after an interception. Beautiful. Well, and he had the celebration that was that very neck. Very neck. Yeah, yeah. 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 Was... She does. She has a Merton Hanks neck. That's yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, D.L. Hughley was brought out from whatever vault they've kept him in. I feel like I haven't <laughs> seen him in 20 years, but God bless. He's looking good, I guess. Uh, Leon Panetta. Just like, of what course. are what are we doing, folks? Where, where, who scheduled this? Where Panetta is night four right before? Like, where, what is what this? What are we doing? Like, why? Yeah. And then uh, gorgeous... because we have to get we have to get into we have to invoke Reagan. We have to start talking about how the Democrats are this great firewall Putin, against all the evil Putin. dictators in the world. Yeah, That's right. It's like, come on. It's so brutal. Now, along with uh, Shapiro and Bashir, Gretchen Whitmer was one of the mm. the people. I thought she was terrible. Like, I really yeah, didn't too. feel the vibe with her. And I think, I think I've think i heard her be better than this. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, one takeaway I really had with from all this was that with Walls, we dodged, the Dems dodged a bullet. You know, yeah, like yeah. A lot, any of these other choices would have been worse. I mean, maybe these will all people be good in some other role yeah. in the future. Maybe they should have just gone, they should have gone back to John Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I wonder what he was up to on Thursday night. I'm sure something devious. Um, <laughs> then they had... Eva Longoria come just before mm -hmm. Harris, but no Evan Longoria. Curious. Well, they're an, saving that. An yeah. anti-baseball bias, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> and then there was the Harris speech. And, you know, I didn't take any notes because I was, you know, all of this was tedious, but I was feeling pretty good. And the first part of Harris speech, I was like, this is fine. And then when she started talking yeah. about, uh, it was fine. I didn't say it was good. And then when she started talking about how she wants us to have the most lethal military force and oh, started screaming God. about um, talking as if what's happening in Gaza, which is terrible, is, is exactly proportional to what Hamas did to Israel. Um, you know, look, I don't want anyone to be killed by terrorists or armies, right? 
Uh, but I yeah. think we're really there's a really weird kind of sense of proportionality where you look at what's happening in Gaza, where possibly over a hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand people have been killed, mm -hmm. and like you know, G October seventh was terrible, obviously, and like no one should be murdered at a you know um, music festival or anywhere else, but. <laughs> There's just an no, I, there, there's an inability to reckon with the magnitude of what's happening with Gaza, and I mean it's not even that there's an inability. There's a willful a will, decision to it, not right. It certainly feels and, that way. And I think that the I had this thought the other day when I was reading various tweets on the old feed, and it occurred to me that since the time I've been paying attention, right? Yeah. Um, from basically I guess like the first Gulf War. Yeah. Right. I would say is when I started seeing what was going on, obviously not understanding it. I realized that one of the great tells, and it's not like a brilliant thought or anything, is that whenever anybody ever in the history of this time period I'm talking about has ever tried to present to me an understanding for the plight of the Palestinians, right, in the American or even mostly global political mainframe. Whenever they talk about it, the first thing and people they mention are the Israelis. And the second one, the second group is the Palestinians. And they say that as though it shows that they understand that through both sides, oh, I know it's complicated. And so it's always, it's always. And it doesn't matter who it is. It can be AOC. It can be uh, Vice President Harris, right? And what's going to happen is you're going to get something at the beginning of the sentence that's like, we need a ceasefire to bring the hostages home yeah, and end the needless suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza every single time. And to me, this is not only the very least you could do in terms of addressing the proportionality or frankly, the heinous lack of proportionality yeah. would be for once in my lifetime, give a speech or a talk about this situation. And even if you're going to address the, the both sides of it all, as to me, as deranged as that is at this current moment, given the proportionality, why do you never begin with what is happening to those people, to the Palestinians, ever? And at some point, and that goes with every single tweet from every single news organization, right? Every single New York Times or every single time. And at that point, it is deliberate, I think. And, you know, you start first with the, the lethal army stuff, right? Let's, let's, let's go back to that for just one second. This is classic democratic politics, the classic thing that they have identified this group of people that they need for some reason to win every election Apparently, their idea of the undecided voter that will swing to them are these like vicious war hawks yeah. who want to destroy everybody and who definitely don't want to hear anything about what is happening in the Palestinians. And I just don't think those people are a all that real. And B, I don't think that that's actually true for this moment. I actually don't believe that coming out with some sort of stance about conditions, at the very least, never yeah. mind threatening to remove funding for weapons, would be anything other than a positive in this election. No, and, and I mean that's when you get into real scary territory. It's been pointed out that Reagan, uh, George H. W. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush were all to the left of the Biden Harris position as, as regards absolutely, this. and that seems strange, and I don't fully understand. The what uh what the thinking I here don't know is either. but you it's know, I, either some some cynical mysterious political factor of the amount of money that the military industrial complex sure. needs or provides or jobs that are created and which where Lockheed Martin factories are yep. and that is is only worse it, it, or or as bad as genuinely believing what is being uttered here. I mean, what is being said is, I mean, this is another great example. To cite the sexual violence that was encountered by Israelis on October 7th and not then cite the sexual violence that has been encountered by Palestinians in all the time since. Yeah. yeah. What is that decision about? 
what conclusion can we possibly make other than you don't actually think that these two groups of people are equal? Yeah, it's, I it's, don't know what other conclusion I can come to. Uh, no, it's uh, it's confounding and it's it's awful. Um, just wrapping up, a couple more things I wanted to touch on. Really, not a lot of stuff on climate at this uh, convention. No, no, uh, no, no, no. Not a lot of real policy stuff in general, which no. uh, that's fu that's fine. Uh, not anything that coherent about immigration. I mean, except to reiterate that they will sign and enact the brutally vicious anti-immigrant, anti-asylum <laughs> seeker bill that, that Trump right. scuttled in, yeah. in the House right. this year. That's the other undecided voter, right? They also apparently really hate all immigrants. Yeah. It's like, who is this person? That not only hates immigrants, no, wants not, to I'm blow like, up everyone. So I'm doing like one of those identikits, trying to find his face. Well, right. It's, like, it's not, not only that is not only is that part of what confuses me. It's like once you take all those characteristics that we just described, you throw in, you know, wanting a, a increased border security. Yeah. Um, are those people voting for a Democrat? That's no that's the thing that say? I don't understand. This, <laughs> this, and. This tack to the know. middle. That, so who, does this, who does this tack to the middle really peel off? It doesn't I mean, feel and like it's not a tack to a middle. It's a tack to it's a tack bunch to the, of to really the, it's right to the, wing to the right. You're right. Perspectives and inventing like a guy who's going to swing this election, and that is the the borders of such a great example. They stand up and they what they've always you know it's from John Kerry coming out and saying reporting for duty yeah. and trying to like yep. basically say I'm even I'm even more of a war. I'm guy. more it's of like, a dude, jingoistic maniac. Than even the yeah, guy who like, launched dude, man, a pointless war in Iraq. <laughs> you know? Right, like, like what happened to you? You were on like a war crimes tribunal, or, yeah, or you yeah. know, the, whatever he, you know, the hearings that he spoke pretty candidly about Vietnam, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's and, it's dark. Uh, so, in any case, the, the Harris speech really took the wind out of my sails. I just had a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, I had that moment of realization that one often has in these politics that even mm -hmm. if they, you know, and I, I much prefer Harris to win, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. You just realize like, oh, this isn't going to change anything. You know, the status quo is too, too firmly ensconced. And even if the yeah. slightly better of these two options gets in, there's not really going to be a lot of movement on climate. There's not going to be movement on health care. There's not going to be meaningful movement right. in a, you know, at all. And sure, it's it's a convention. So these are these are the these are the con, like the conventions of yeah, the convention. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it says it sort of it definitely says something that you have you know you look you just scan the transcript, and there's a page and two pages <laughs> describing various members of her family and how hard they worked, which I'm sure fine, okay. And there is, there are eight lines about Israel Palestine. Yeah. Like, like, what are we doing here, folks? You know, um, well, it's pretty, it's we're, pretty depressing. As you say, we're not going back, but it seems like we're already back. So how can we not go somewhere we already are? Yeah, Ooh, that's right. Paradox. <laughs> um, but next week, we're going to uh, talk about a little bit more of a lighter topic. Um, I'd say much lighter topic. In <laughs> yeah, fact, lighter than one air. of the lightest, <laughs> one of the lightest topics. That's right. That's right. Um, what what is let's, it? Let's Mike? talk a bit. We're gonna be we're gonna be looking at the saga of the balloon boy, and um, if you don't know what that is, we very much encourage you to look uh, look it up or don't, and riot. we will enlighten you next week. It is a it's an absolute riot, but we do want to kind of start talking about things that people. Uh, went nuts over social sort of media, so, social media manias, if you will. Uh, yeah, and just the, the sense, uh, the weird, the weird doomerism of quotidian style things. Yeah. So, like the incredible attention and concern that was created by the balloon boy, and sort of what that says about our response, I think, to to crises. Um, and maybe what it right? bodes for. The next real crisis, uh, whenever or the next balloon boy, yeah, be. or the next. <laughs> well said. Um, well, I think it'll be fun. Uh, it's a little less uh, of a heavy, a little not as heavy as uh, some of the stuff we got into this week, mm -hmm. and uh, I look forward to that. Uh, but until then, this has been the end of the world with Michael and Stu. I'm Michael. 
I'm Stu, and we'll talk to you real soon.